The scenes you're about to see took place at the Alice Springs Hospital in the heart of Australia. On a day in September 1977, 14 eye operations were performed by an eye specialist from Sri Lanka. They were the direct result of one of the country's most exhaustive eye health programs ever undertaken. In two years, eye doctors examined over 70,000 people. Called the National Trachoma and Eye Health Program, its main aim was the elimination of the chronic eye infection trachoma, sometimes known as sandy blight, among the people it affects most, the Aborigines. It meant that medical field teams had to examine people and carry out surgery in some of the hottest and most isolated areas of Australia. Many eye specialists volunteered their time and skills to the trachoma program, skills they were always happy to explain to anyone who was interested. The pupil has been dilated by using certain drops before the operation to enable the lens to be removed through the pupil. And uh, one is now going to make an incision in the eye um, at the junction between the sclera, which is the white outer covering of the eye, and the cornea, which is the clear window of the eye. And uh, in this technique, uh, we use uh, this particular type of blade, um, similar to what is called the gravy knife. And uh, the knife is introduced there. It enters what is called the anterior chamber and then it traverses the anterior chamber behind the cornea. Brought out there. The section is completed by a single movement of the knife which produces a cut. Two by one, or the corneal forceps. Yes. It's a very turgid lens, it's sort of overripe. The cataract removed, this patient's sight will soon return with the help of glasses. Cataracts are a common cause of partial blindness among many elderly people. This man's more fortunate than most of his age, for in the center of Australia where he lives, a quarter of the Aborigines over 60 are blind. The sun has turned off its brilliance for the day, and an informal sing-along called a pullapa is held at Lajamanu settlement, formerly Hooker Creek. <laughs> These people still retain much of their culture, but their traditional way of life has been drastically altered. The early explorers and settlers contributed to those changes. Among their contributions were flour and sugar, 
and Aborigines began to gather around these more readily available sources of food, no longer moving as foraging nomadic units across their traditional lands. European settlement also brought new diseases which had tragic consequences for these people. Diseases like the eye infection trachoma. What the Aborigines of Outback Australia didn't receive were the rules and knowledge for dealing with their new infectious environment. Australia is the world's largest island continent. It was once home to over 500 Aboriginal tribes. Traditionally, these people used to live in small nomadic groups. They often remained in areas for short periods at a time, moving on before they had time to pollute their environment. Today, the majority of Australia's Aboriginals live in large groups on the fringe of white communities, in settlements and missions. In these isolated and often overcrowded black communities, the diseases which white societies cast off over 50 years ago are still creating enormous and very serious health problems. Trachoma is one of those diseases. It thrives where the climate is hot and dry. This is how trachoma starts. The eyes become red and begin to water, producing a pus which may become infected with other germs. Naturally, the eye looks and feels sore. When the eyelid is turned up, small white round things called follicles can often be seen. It's the presence of follicles which helps doctors make the diagnosis. The word trachoma comes from a Greek word meaning rough. The roughened surface on this eyelid is caused by the small red spots you can see called papilla. When a person's had trachoma for a while, scars appear on the inside of the eyelid. Like scars on other parts of the body, they shrink. There may be hundreds on the eyelid or just a few. Another stage of trachoma is when a white band spreads across the center of the eye. It's given the Latin word for cloth, panis. Actually a scar caused by the infection, it may grow right down across the eye. This is what causes the pain in bright light and also blindness. The scarring often causes the lid to be twisted so that the eyelashes rub against the eye. It's painful, makes the condition worse and helps to lead to blindness. These then were some of the eye infections the trachoma teams discovered when they examined the people of the outback. They were to see the young and the old, in fact, everybody likely to be affected by trachoma. It was the most ambitious and specific health program ever sponsored by a medical college. In two years, the National Trachoma and Eye Health Program was to send eye specialists from the Royal Australian College of Ophthalmologists thousands of miles around Australia. Their task was to find out how much trachoma existed and start treatment programs. With one and a half million dollars from the Australian government, the trachoma program got underway in February 1976. Most of the travelling was by car, which took the field teams over some of the roughest and most beautiful country in Australia. The main advantage of four wheels was that the teams were able to make direct contact with the hundreds of isolated Aboriginal camps in the centre and far north of the country. The two field teams each consisted of two eye doctors, an orthoptist and assistant, a nursing sister, a microbiologist, an optical dispenser, and a field clerk. Approximately half the team members were Aboriginal. The permanent team was led by Professor Fred Hollows. During the two years of the trachoma program, he was assisted by visiting eye specialists who volunteered two or three weeks of their time to work with him, screening Aborigines and recommending follow-up treatment. As their work progressed, the need for the program became apparent to everyone involved. 
the hard facts are that in an affluent country like this, there are incredible pockets of poverty and disease, including eye disease. As, you, as uh, anybody who looks hard at the average, or looks even superficially at the Aboriginal scene will, will see. Um, why it exists 200 years after settlement started? That's a, the great problem of, uh, of opposing cultures. And only recently have enough people uh, in, a, in executive positions begun to realise the need to understand Aboriginal people and get them involved and uh, in their own, uh, in relief of their own situation. According to Professor Hollows, the real cure for black health problems lies in establishing better communication with Aborigines. What must be remembered is that throughout Australia, 150 separate Aboriginal languages are still spoken, and there are more than 600 distinct dialects. For this reason, the Tacoma teams arranged for Aboriginal field officers to travel in advance of them and explain the program and consult with the local people. In this way, Aborigines were able to fully understand how the trachoma program could benefit them and their children. Uh, tell you what, all, what's it all about. Mm. So, if you'd like to go and see him, oh, at, uh, oh, CWA oh, clinic, oh, CWA oh, restaurant, oh, you go at three o'clock. Oh, if you haven't got a way of going up, I'll come call in and pick you up. Right, in the isolated areas of Australia, Aborigines are offered health care through clinics like this one at Wave Hill in the Northern Territory. Like most outback clinics, it's run by white nursing sisters. Here, the Aboriginal nursing aides are trained to give very basic health care to their own people. They are luckier than other Aboriginal nurses in the outback. Many are nothing more than glorified cleaning ladies, only being asked to sweep and clean the floors of the clinic. The people associated with black health care say it's a situation which has to change as soon as possible. For if Aborigines are to learn the rules for dealing with their environmental diseases, such as the eye, ear, nose and throat infections, then clinics must eventually be run by Aboriginal nursing sisters. Only when Aborigines become totally involved in their own community health programs at all levels, will Aboriginal health standards be lifted? This is a view shared by all members of the trachoma program. Uh, hygiene and uh, individual health care require several things. It requires that people care, and it requires that people be involved in the process. And this is why it's perfectly natural. And uh, there are very good uh, uh, sociological or medico-sociological reasons for having community-based health care services uh, in our Aboriginal groups. They should be calling the shots, hiring and firing resource personnel of, uh, of any race, and they should be deciding policy. Uh, only when this occurs will environmental health diseases uh, amongst Aborigines be significantly lessened. Just west of Darwin is Delisaville an Aboriginal settlement of 181 people, 36 of whom are white. On the veranda of the clinic, the trachoma team follow a well-established routine. It begins with everyone providing basic information about themselves. And what's your name? King. And how old are you? Six years old. Okay. This information, when collated with medical reports, will eventually provide one of the most comprehensive studies of outback health care. Right, Jesse, cover up this eye first. That's the way. Which way does this one go? Good. Next, a vision test. A simple one, one using just the letter E, which only requires the person this taking one? the test to Very indicate good. the yeah, way it's facing. Eye. Can't see him. What about this one? All the north one and all the north. This woman, being examined by an eye doctor, was one of 36 Aborigines who required further medical eye care. None of the white people at Delisaville were found to have any eye problems. Training yeah. too? It's all white, so it's a, probably an injury, and it's, it's very small and soft, and it's all damaged. Very soft eye, that one. Okay. Not much good. This one might have a cataract. 
have to have a class of book light up. Okay. Sophisticated eye examination equipment was also used in the field. The slit lamp enabled doctors to determine the extent of eye damage and recommend what further action should be taken. Up. Yeah, how about this one? Good. What about this one here? Okay, can you see that one? Wearing frames that would turn a pop star can green with envy, another here? eye test is carried out. How about that one? Hop. Yeah? How about this one here? That's tremendous. Can you get the bottom line right, do you think? Good. What about if I go a little bit further backwards? Can you see it? Down. Yeah, tremendous. These colourful trial one? glasses, as okay, they're called, really establish good. precisely how well a person can see. They're often used after a cataract operation to find out whether a stronger pair of glasses is needed. Can I get that oh, you want that bag, yeah? Mm. Mm. Fitting people for glasses was an important aspect of the trachoma program. That looks all right. Okay. It was found that many people required a stronger pair than the ones they possessed. Of the 4,000 pair of glasses prescribed, two-thirds of them went to Aborigines. The orders were sent to the OPSM company in Sydney. Within a few weeks, the glasses would be sent to their new owner exactly as they ordered them. It was service that gave 4,000 people a new look at life. All right, Kevin. Well, what we want to do here is get a small amount of water out of your eye. And we do that by putting in one of these little pieces of paper and I pick it up with these forceps here, put it in the eye and take it out again when it gets wet. So, you've got to turn around here. That's the way. Turn around and lie back here. Now, Karen, I want you to keep watching this crab here, all right? Another essential part of the two-year trachoma program was the work carried out by the microbiologists in the field. Because different types of trachoma exist, it was important to find out what types were present in each community. This meant collecting tear and blood samples from a number of people in each area for later analysis in the laboratory. One of the main problems was preserving the specimens in the hot, dry conditions. This was overcome by placing them in containers of liquid nitrogen at a temperature of minus 196 degrees centigrade. The containers were then sent to the microbiology department at the University of Melbourne. In the laboratory, the samples would undergo a number of tests. As well as the tear and blood samples, the microbiologists collected cells from underneath the upper eyelids of people found to have trachoma badly. These samples were inoculated into cell cultures or into eggs so that the microorganism that causes trachoma could grow. The eggs were then placed at a controlled temperature where they remained for approximately 14 days. The next test is one that would put most people off eggs for breakfast for a long time. To the laboratory team, it's all in a day's work and is treated with clinical detachment and a professional nonchalance. Once the yolk sacs of these eggs were separated, samples were smeared onto glass slides. After being stained, the slides were placed under the microscope and the tests were nearly complete. For microbiologists, this is the moment of truth. Will they find what they're looking for? The answer is on the slide. Trachoma particles, thousands of tiny dots surrounded by the much larger blood cells of the chicken. From this analysis, the laboratory team is able to tell what type of trachoma is present in each community, important information which will contribute to the elimination of the disease.
Wattie Creek in the Northern Territory, traditional land of the Karinji people. Where once their forefathers roamed, they now run 3,000 head of cattle on a 1,250 square mile cattle station they own. Mustering is backbreaking work. Heat and dust add to the difficulties, but for years, Aboriginal stockmen have faced a much more serious threat to their health. They are victims of an eye disease known as Lab K, or by its full name, Labrador keratopathy. Like trachoma, Lab K is an environmental disease and often leads to blindness. It's come to be known as the cattle industry's special contribution to black eye problems. Here at Wattie Creek, in the heart of cattle country, six new cases of Lab K were discovered. A disease which always prompts discussion between eye specialists. Now, Tom, look, just look up for me, Tom. You'll see in the lower half of his cornea, you'll see it hazy there. Look down, Tom. Now, he's got a bit of... Uh... Look up for me, Tom. But you'll see that lower half quite hazy. Mm. Now, over here, you'll see the same lower half cornea. This one's got a bit of pigment whirl into it as well. Mm. Then you can see the trachoma uh, panis above. But mm. there's a clear area where you can see through to the pupil. Mm. Look up now, Tom, look right up. But then all of the lower half, you'll see, hazy. Mm. And you'll see those little epithelial droplets. How long were you a stockman, Tom? Uh... I was since when I was a kid. Since you were a kid, until you were almost an old man. Yeah. More than 20 years, eh? Oh, more than 20 years. Yeah. They almost always have been stockmen for more than 20 years. Oh. And in the cattle area, practically every man that's over 40 that's been a stockman's got it. Mm -hmm. And we've seen about four or five women with it. We've seen white people with it. All they all in their 80s. Oh. All real old timers. And uh, also to make him water, see? Oh. Just enough to sort of catch the light. But he hasn't got it badly, but still that'd be enough to cut his vision down a couple of lines. To anyone visiting Bathurst Island for the first time, it appears as a tropical paradise with its palm trees and balmy weather. To the Tiwi people, the island has been home for as long as anyone can remember. At this Aboriginal mission, run by a Catholic order, 800 men, women and children do lead something of an idyllic existence. Among these island people, there are few eye infections and no evidence of poor vision or blindness. It's simply that here, living conditions are not crowded and there's plenty of water for washing people and clothes. Even so, the doctors did discover that many people required treatment for ear infections. But compared to other areas of Australia, the Tiwi people are very healthy. With the examinations over, it was an opportunity for the director of the trachoma program to meet the island's nursing aides and explain what trachoma is and how to look for the obvious signs. Can you see these little white things here? Can you all see those? Yes. They are little follicles, little trachoma follicles. You see these in the children, and they're the ones that... That's why we're looking at all the school kids, and you can see those. Next one, please. They should get a little... Oh, here's it. You can see them. See the white dots? Very easy to see, they're trachoma follicles. They're still only grade one follicles. Now, see this one. You can see all the follicles here. And this kid's got a lot of follicles, and that'd be your follicles grade three. You can see this, this child almost looks balanced, doesn't he? Almost looks as though he's white. He's, got a, he's a part Aboriginal pe person, so, but you don't have to be an Aborigine to have this disease. Anybody can get it. And a lot of white people uh, have had it, and a lot of white people used to have it. And before people had houses and a lot of these good things that you've got here in, in um, Bathurst Island, they used to have a lot of these problems. Give us the next one, Anna. That's a ring in that slide. Go on. Uh, just, no, just, can you see? Come up here, Juanita. Come up here. Can you see those little red dots? 
all over the place. Can you all see them? Yes. Yeah, the tiny little red dots, they're called papillae. Now turn, you see that? You can't see the dots there, but you'll see those on that. That's another sign of trachoma. I always say a blind man on a galloping horse on a dark night without a light could diagnose trachoma. It's easy, it's an easy condition to diagnose. Although you wouldn't think so, would you, Frank, with some of the, uh, what are those white, those white things there, those yellowy things? They're follicles, aren't they? That, those follicles, people say that the trachoma is active when they see the follicles. And um, generally when you see the follicles, often the children have running noses and often they have a cough and often they have the same time when a kid's nose is running and he may have pus from coming from his ears or have a cough. That's about the time when they have these follicles. Next slide, please. The field teams arrive at Burke Reserve, where eye doctors first examined the people in 1971. To their surprise, the place had hardly changed at all. Some 200 Aborigines still live in a variety of dwellings which look like something topsy-built. The doctors wanted to examine those people, mainly the elderly, who'd been unable to attend the trachoma clinic in the nearby town. It was also an occasion to renew old acquaintances. How long is it since I first saw you, Rocky? No. Must be about six years ago. No. Remember with that Shirley Smith lady? Do you remember her? No. Look down now, Rocky. He's got grade three scarring, hasn't he? Yeah. You know, the myobamian openings are right on the conjunctival surface. And he's got grade one trichiasis there. It's a traumatic uh, madriasis on the right of the dislocated mature cataract. On the left side, he's got some cataract. Yeah. So, uh, we'll just get, we'll score him, I'll score him in a minute. Let's have a look in here, Rocky. Mm. And what about, is he on any treatment for that plasma cytoma thing that? No, he doesn't need treatment. Uh, How long's that hand strong. been like that, Rocky? Oh. So since when you first came to Burke? Well, it's been about six years ago or more. Did it just come or what happened? No, a bloke hit me. A bloke hit you? Where did he hit you? He hit me the smasher of the senior man. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know what we... Just, it's Rocky, you look at me. Can you see how many fingers I got up? No, it's two of the fingers. How many have I got up now? You yeah, were four. That's right. If I just... Rocky, can you see these now? Four. Yeah, it's about five. So he's about 6.36, isn't he? Yeah. Right. In the left, and he's about... Oh. All right. Have we, we got a form for him? Yeah. Rocky, you tell me if you can see my light going on. Are you on now? Tell me when it goes off then, Rocky. Are you off? Tell me when it goes on. Are you on now? Good. It's about seven years since we first came here and yeah. we've had a look at all the people again. What are your impressions? Well, my impressions are that the people are probably a bit healthier than they were then. Yeah. A lot less uh, respiratory disease than there was in those times and not as much active trachoma as there was then. Yeah, so well, we, we certainly not. haven't seen as much pus in kids' noses and the ears, although still many times the white rate, are much better. But uh, Burke Reserve looks a bit better. They've got toilets around the place and a, and, and ablution block. Of course, the dam show shouldn't be here, should it? No. That's, you know, uh, we've had seven years. Surely all of the Aborigines in Burke could have been housed in those seven years. After 18 months, the field teams had worked their way across the centre, the west and north of Australia, reaching Queensland in September of 1977. In this part of the country, the trachoma program was faced with its first real obstacle. Two Aboriginal field officers were alleged to have been involved in political activities. Shortly afterwards, the Queensland schedule was deferred. As a result, thousands of Aborigines were not examined. But the deferment of the program in Queensland was not as serious to Aboriginal health 
as many people believed. The assistant director of the program, Gordon Briscoe, explains why. Well, the closure of the Queensland program uh, didn't affect um, the situation in Queensland greatly because the environmental health of Aborigines in Queensland is relatively higher than it is in other particular parts of Australia. And I mentioned specifically the Northern Territory, parts of Western Australia and South Australia. So that um, while trachoma exists in Queensland, uh, it's not the uh, kind of problem uh, in which other Aboriginal people face in, in states that I've mentioned because uh, the social conditions under which Aboriginal people live are not as polluted and therefore don't generate the kind of infectious pools which uh, have been exposed in this, uh, this uh, trachoma program. A good example of this is to be found at Doomagee Mission the first Aboriginal mission visited by the Tacoma teams in Queensland. Hey, James, look here. here, water is readily available at the turn of a tap. But for the children, the nearby Nicholson River is more fun than turning on a faucet. Another popular spot for the children is the school's swimming pool. While the diving styles might leave a lot to be desired, the combination of water and chlorination help reduce the risk of eye infections among the young at Dumagee. Combined with the utilization of washing facilities, lack of overcrowding, and reasonable hygiene and sanitation, places like Dumagee are far less of a health problem area. At Dumagee, children were among the first to be screened for trachoma. Hey, try it again. He might say something. He <laughs> might say something different. Listen. Oh, he keeps saying the same thing for you. Hey, yeah, uh, take me with you. Yeah, take me with you. Okay, come, come here, Ken, Ned. Let's have a look. You want to take me? That's one one. Nord Frizes. Nord Frizen. Tip your head up, Ken. Look down now. He's got a trigium on the right. Nortropanus nortropits. How old's Ken Ned? Ten. What are you? Ten. Ten. Uh, one one. Trigium on the right. 372.4. Medial trigium. Examinations of the young underlined the importance of the eye health program. Thousands of school children were screened in this way, with the eye doctors looking for the telltale signs of trachoma. At Dumagee, few cases were discovered among the young. Yeah, one for Panis, naught for Pitts. One for Panis, naught for Pitts. Look down for me, Kevin. What? Naught one one. Naught one one. On your way, young Kevin. That's just fine. Sit down, Claris. Claris Walden, how are you, little one? Give us a look at your hands. Show me your hands, that's all right. Do you want to go with that rabbit or what? Pull him and see what he says, Claris. Pull him hard. I like you. Hear that? That rabbit <laughs> likes you, doesn't it? Tip your head up. Eye problems were more evident among the older people at Dumagee. Many had suffered their health difficulties for years without complaint and with little treatment. The trachoma field teams found that this was often the attitude older Aborigines have. They simply learn to live with their health problems. It's an attitude which has convinced the eye doctors that, unlike our society, the majority of Aborigines are generally non-neurotic about their health. Unlike white societies, these people have no rules for dealing with their environmental diseases. So they accept the inevitable and put up with their problem. Age 76, he waits patiently for the corrective surgery which will end the pain and discomfort he suffers from ingrowing eyelashes. Using a local anesthetic, this surgery corrects the problem, allowing the eyelashes to again grow outward. Repeated attacks of trachoma and lack of treatment cause this condition and the field teams operated on over 80 cases like this during the two-year program. 
But I generally do a, uh, a triple hitch when we're starting. I'll, I'll put another knot in here. Got him. Just cut down on that. That's better. That's better. There's a lot of Aborigines sitting around in the bush that this simple little operation could, you know, could cause them to retain their sight. I'll just do one throw this time, I think, on the horn. See, now they will be buckling. This is called a Lester Jones Entropian Repair. And it's a simple little operation to do. It appears to be quite effective. Cut it for me. Those three switches are the key ones. I might give him a little dressing on that, you know, Gabby. Mm, I think I could just about nice. do it. No, Sid, hold it there, Sid. Did you hear? Oh, stay there, stay there. No, you're right, Sid. Just, Just putting a little bandage on. It's it. Take your hand away again. Three times round the top, right? That's the scaffold on which your bandage hangs. Within a few days, the here. bandage will be removed, and the pain and discomfort this man has suffered again. for a long time yes, will have disappeared. Tape, a positive solution in minutes for an eye infection which existed far too long. With the Queensland part of the program postponed, the field teams moved into New South Wales to places like Wilcannia Reserve, which accommodates some 300 Aborigines. Their housing is far from conventional, but not from choice. It's all there is. Conditions like these make it difficult, if not impossible, to maintain a reasonable standard of hygiene. But providing better housing along European lines is not necessarily the answer for Aboriginal reserves such as Wilcannia. It's not necessarily a question of housing. It's a matter of achieving utilization of certain health amenities. For instance, in this place where we're sitting, there's about 300 people living here. And I believe, I haven't done a precise count, but I don't think there's more than four taps over this 200 acres. Now, no way in the world can these people utilize the, the approximately 20 gallons of water that each person needs to utilize to be healthy in terms of hygiene in a hot climate like this. A house is a place where people can get certain health amenities. Uh, how it's arranged and how many bedrooms there are uh, I'm, is not of interest to me, but they must be able to spread out a bit at night. They must be able to have water and showering. They must be able to wash their clothes. Look at the areas where we've seen the scabies and leprosy and the incredible skin infections that abound amongst Aborigines. One in 30 of all the Aborigines in the Northern Territory has leprosy. One in 20 of all the Aborigines in the Northern Territory contract syphilis each year. These appalling figures will only be brought about when certain health amenities are utilized by Aborigines. Now the problem is providing those facilities. In camps like this, those facilities don't exist. First, we have to provide them, and then the hearts and minds job to enable the utilization to occur has to happen. During their two years of work, the National Trachoma and Eye Health teams screened over 20,000 white people. Their findings tell the story. Of all the people seen during the course of the program, it was discovered that Aborigines possessed a blindness rate which is ten times greater than the white people examined. Which way is it go? The significant difference in the standard of health is to be seen among the children. These children have parents who know and use the well-established community rules for health. Their families usually possess better living conditions with all the health amenities white society demands and gets. The result is environmental diseases like trachoma never get a chance to spread. Look down for me, Catherine. Down at the ground, that's a good one. There, good. Meanwhile, in conditions which would shock any city dweller in the Western world, the Aboriginal camps remain. 
only the housing changes. On settlements and missions, they usually comprise neat concrete dwellings, while others are only makeshift shelters on the fringe. These camps are erected from whatever is available and can readily be put to practical use. Old army tents, strips of canvas, and corrugated iron all have a place, and that place becomes home. Members of the trachoma program have compared some of the living conditions they've seen with the worst to be found in countries like India and Ethiopia. The success of the National Trachoma and Eye Health program was due in no small part to the communication the field teams established between themselves and the Aboriginal groups and communities. Many people believe that Aborigines do not care about themselves or their health standards. But they are a people who care very much and want to be involved at all levels in controlling their health. But achieving that aim has never been easy for them. In many places, Aborigines want to be involved and really care enough, but they, don't, they can't get involvement at other than a most menial level. And this is appalling, this is particularly so, of West Australia and in the Northern Territory and to an extent in, and in South Australia where there is no significant Aboriginal input at a high level in health policy making or health executive functions. In New South Wales, hopefully, there have been many, several moves uh, to rectify this. And uh, in Queensland, there's very little health input, at, Aboriginal health input, or Aboriginal and Islander health input at a significant level. Aborigines are not consulted about policy and planning in health, and they should be, in fact, uh, making decisions and being consulted effectively. And the, same with the, the National Trachoma Program has ended, but the work goes on. Eye specialists will continue to provide a regular scheduled eye care service to all parts of Australia, and treatment programs have already been started. One of the first took place at Alice Springs. With the help and assistance of Aboriginal leaders, doctors were able to show people within a few minutes just how simple it was to take their medicine. Okay, now you pull the medicine into the spoon, Johnny, and you give that to little boy Johnny Martin, eh? <laughs> and I get some more cool drink. The little boys like cool drink. Yeah. You take that medicine, Johnny. And here, now you have the cool drink. And then we get the book, and this is what we do. We go around the camp, and if it's a, a little boy, a little girl, we get the mixture here and the teaspoon. The instruction so is beginning to take effect. Medicine. The trachoma teams okay. recently treated 10,500 uh, Aborigines living within a 250 mile radius of Alice Springs. They were given anti-trachoma pills and medicine twice a day over a 20 day period. In all, two and a half tons of medicine were handed out. On returning to the area a few weeks later, the field teams found that those people who suffered from trachoma and had been treated showed positive signs of improvement. There's not not one there. And then Norts? Yes, and then Norts, North, North, one, and then Norts there. Trachoma was the main aim of the program, and it's slowly being eliminated. So too are the other serious environmental health diseases of poor hygiene, housing, diet, and lack of community involvement. They're all problems born of the squalor and poverty of the Aboriginal camps, which exist on the fringes of a more affluent Australia. But the ground rules are very clear. The ongoing health treatment program must continue, while communication and Aboriginal involvement must be improved. Only then can their health and their pride and dignity as a people be restored. I'm <laughs>